Hi everyone, welcome to Get Well with Dr. Shell. I am Dr. Shalina Lalji, better known as Dr. Shell, and I know as a board certified OBGYN and a functional medicine expert, your health is unique and deeply personal. It is a combination of genetics, lifestyle, and environment. Know this, no matter what your starting point is, you are never powerless over your health. Being on a health journey is a marathon, not a sprint. This podcast is about walking you through many different perspectives on health conditions, symptoms, and solutions that can help you get from fatigued to fabulous. My mission has always been to offer my patients and community the best of mental, physical, and spiritual wellness. You can learn more about me and my wellness center and schedule your telehealth appointment at drshell.com. We can support you no matter where you are in the world. This podcast is a powerful and simple way to carry the wisdom of thought leaders from around the world in your pocket and continue to develop your own healing journey every single day. So let the journey begin. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Get Well with Dr. Shell. We have an incredible special edition today of our podcast to honor ALS Awareness Month. Today we have with us my very good friend and one of my heroes, Dr. Merit Sukovich, who holds a lot of very prestigious titles. So let me start introducing herself because it's a long list. She's the director of the Sean M. Healy and AMG Center for ALS, the chief of neurology at Mass General Hospital, as well as the director and the Julian Dorn Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Sukovich's research is dedicated to the treatment of people with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Dr. Sukovich is one of the founders and the past co-chairs of the Northeast ALS Consortium, which is a group of over 134 clinical sites around the world dedicated to performing collaborative clinical trials and research in ALS. She has recently launched the first of its kind platform trial initiative in ALS, the Healy ALS Platform Trial, a program that will greatly accelerate therapy development in ALS, which we very much need. Dr. Sukovich, it is such an honor to be talking with you today. Thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to bring some hope to ALS patients and their families. This is going to be such an important episode. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here to talk uh, with you about ALS and the future and the hope. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm really open about my husband's ALS diagnosis and our journey as a family on my podcast. It's mentioned very often since I interview so many people with unique insights on neurodegenerative diseases, because we really, really want to create awareness and really spread the word and um, you know do more trials and find the root causes, and hopefully one day soon, a cure for ALS. But for those of um, our listeners who maybe just have a little idea of what ALS is, even if it's from the Ice Bucket Challenge a few years ago, could you please, in your beautiful way, explain what ALS is, what treatments are currently available on the market for patients, and where this field is going? Oh, sure. So um, you mentioned what the word stands for, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This is an illness that falls in a group of illnesses called neurodegenerative diseases. These are illnesses that get more common as someone gets older. But this, this illness, ALS, can happen to people in their teenage years or 20s up to 90. Um, it, and it's a progressive illness where people lose Uh, the ability to use their muscles. And that can be in their hands, their legs, speech, breathing, uh, swallowing, really every muscle. Um, It's, I consider it actually one of the worst neurological illnesses and one that we have to, um, you know, speed up to find treatments. Now, having said all that, uh, there is hope. You know, there are some treatments out there. So there are, um, as as I know you know, there there are a couple marketed drugs for people with ALS. in particular in the United States, and they slow down the illness um, a little bit, you know, 10 to, to 30%. And, and one of them treats a symptom. But, and there's care. We know that people who get good multidisciplinary care, um, uh, they, they have better quality of life, they live longer. So that's really important. But we, but we don't have the treatments that stop the illness. 
and that's what we need. Um, but there's there's a lot of trials going on. Right, right. And you know um, what really is very very um, hope giving to families like like us and uh, thousands of other families out there is that there has been more work in this field. I would say in the last 10 years or more progress in this field in the last 10 years than literally almost a century. What do you attribute that to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it has to do with two things that came almost at the same time. Um, and this is my thoughts on it. I think the science was getting more exciting as that people were understanding some of the biology and getting tools, but there wasn't a lot of funding for it. So it was still a small group of scientists working on it. Then all of a sudden the ice bucket challenge came and, and there was a lot of money and, and a lot of recognition about the illness and awareness. And all of a sudden, all those ideas that people had of, of what to do in ALS could get done because of the, of the funding. And that just fed more and more ideas. And now we're at a stage where, you know, I'm actually seeing medical students who have done ALS research and want to go into ALS. And there's um, lots of uh, neurologists going into ALS. There's tons of companies over 160 that are developing treatment for ALS. So I think it, I think it got that jump start by the money and the science at the right time. Isn't that isn't that the truth? And of course, I would say um, a wonderful woman named Dr. Merit Sukovich, I think, <laughs> who has just been a warrior for this disease. I mean, I can't say enough about you know how much you have with your team, of course. But I mean, you need that leadership to be able to really drive it. Um, you know, and everybody knows where we got introduced to ALS, you know, and for most families, it's someone that you love is diagnosed and this becomes a mission and a purpose and a passion of your life and the life of your, your family. Um, on a personal note, um, Merit, what would you say, could you share with others where your drive came from? for ALS and what drives you every single day you wake up and you're looking for novel approaches and innovative treatments and putting together trials and helping your patients, what drives you? I think it's evolved um, over time. When I initially started out as a young resident at Mass General, mm -hmm. you know, the discovery of the first gene that caused one of the familial forms of ALS happened at Mass General with Dr. Brown. And the same time, the first gene for Huntington's and Alzheimer's was also discovered. And everybody was talking about that. Like, finally, we might be able to develop treatments for all those illnesses. And I was, I was young. I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to develop yeah. treatments for these, these awful illnesses. And I started actually broad and all those illnesses. But then I fell in love with the patients and the families with ALS. And that is what drives me now. They... Yeah. They are friends. Um, it's a unique, I mean, it's just a unique relationship. You get to know people so well and they're so brave and they're so engaged in helping others and the research. And that's my inspiration. Um, I have pictures uh, for, uh, for HIPAA there in the corners, but I have pictures of so many of my patients in my office and they remind me every day to, to keep at it, not to give up, not to let the bumps slow you down and right. uh, to keep breaking down barriers. Well, you know, it's so, so appreciated. I remember I met you when IAS was first diagnosed at uh, the International ALS Symposium in Boston in uh, December of 2017. And, you know, we had just been given the news not even a month prior to that. And, uh, and I don't even know if I've shared this story with you, but you were on my list of people to hunt down during that <laughs> conference. And I remember it was after, yes, it was after a presentation. And I just, you know, I just like went like to you, uh, like you were just a magnet attracting me. And, uh, and I don't know if you remember the conversation, but I just knew that day that, you know, you were going to be a big part of our lives. And, um, you know, and from my family, my husband and my kids, we really thank you for, you know, for always being there for us. Um, you know, it's like Dr. Appel first told us when um, my husband was diagnosed that it's a nice guy's disease. And, uh, you know, he said, I've never met an ALS patient who's not a nice person. And when we say nice guy, you know, we include everybody, right? Yes. Um, and I, you know, having been in this world myself over the last four years, and now, you know, seeing a lot of patients with ALS from even across the globe, it's just, you know, it, it's heartbreaking, right? It's heartbreaking what one person was 
not even a few months ago and where they are now. And uh, so much for that person to really deal with. And the courage um, is just like you mentioned, they're so brave. Um, they just want to keep going and keep fighting. And uh, but it's not easy. Um, so talk to us a little bit about what are the risk factors for ALS? We know that, you know, there's, um, you know, the familial, which is about 10%, 90% is sporadic. So for the sporadic uh, people, as well as for the people who have familial ALS, what triggers that gene to turn on? So what are some of the risk factors that people can be aware of? Yeah, that's a really good question. We don't know all of them, but we know some. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of them is that we can't really control, but is, is aging. So we know that the illness is more common as people get older. Right. Um, we also know that people who, who smoke are at a, a higher risk. It's not a huge increased risk, but it's a real one, like a twofold increased risk. Wow. You know, there's certain professions like people, um, like farmers or welders, mm -hmm. um, and we, that's a clue, you know, what, what exposures are happening that might cause it. There's some controversy over the role of exercise. There's some studies suggesting that, um, you know, athletes such as, um, you know, professional soccer players football player, you know, professional football players, and maybe the, the head injury is a risk factor. I, yeah. I kind of think that there's more studies suggesting that those are real risk factors than those that are not that clear. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to share that there was a really important paper by Dr. Amar Ashalabi in the UK, where he really uh, looked at these risk factors and came up with really good data that it's not one, that for each individual person, it's probably five or six things that happen over your lifetime that, that cause ALS. And if you carry a gene, that gene might account for like three or four of them, but there's still other things that happen. And that makes it really difficult to figure out all the, the risk factors. But I, I think we, we need to figure them out so we can really think about prevention as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And you mentioned some very, very important ones. You know, when you go back and look at the farmers and the welders, it just kind of makes me think, you know, environmental toxins um, could be a big, um, what kind of studies have been done as far as that goes? Or are they in process? They're in process. One of the, I think the biggest uh, ones recently have been done by uh, the group at University of Michigan looking at uh, large data sets of, of environmental toxins in that state. And I'm not saying Michigan's any worse than anywhere else, or, but, but they particularly studied it. And, mm -hmm. But there, it's still ongoing work, but it's important to be able to do those, those type of studies. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, again, I think the biggest thing here is we're all keeping our, an open mind, right, to find out, you know, what could be contributing so that um, we can hopefully one day prevent ALS from actually getting triggered um, and uh, I don't know if you're okay to talk about some of that work that's being done. Uh, is that something that you can talk about, about oh, the prevention of ALS? Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. So yeah. and I'll say just the fact that we can talk, we can say those words is so exciting. And the other set of words maybe we'll have time to talk to is about arresting ALS, meaning like stopping this progression. Okay. But for prevention, um, so there's a big initiative um, starting in, in the United States and uh, planning to partner with the European groups as well to study people at high risk for getting ALS. So people okay. who might carry the, a gene for it um, and to understand the environmental triggers and other things that might influence um, uh, actually getting the illness or not and taking those learnings from that group mm -hmm. and applying it to the whole population. We know that this has been successful in other illnesses, like in Parkinson's disease and in Alzheimer's, where if you can do basically big data collections, you can understand those risk factors, and then you can start to plan interventions early or before symptoms. Right. Exciting. That is super exciting. And, you know, I, I have to thank you for, you know, always um, keeping um, us in, in mind and in heart to be involved with uh, those kinds of projects. It's just been an honor to, you know, in some way, bring some light to it with whatever our experiences, whatever limited experience we might have. Um, so when you look at preventing ALS, you know, say somebody comes in familial ALS, our goal is to try to identify what those triggers are or could be and try to remove those triggers or treat it preemptively. Discussing this and a lot of different um, groups and studies are happening with this. Can you talk about 
what we have found out so far on the gut microbiome and ALS with some of the studies that are actually being done at your institution. Yes, I think this is such a new and exciting area in, in ALS, but also in other neurodegenerative diseases. So it really does look like the um, gut microbiome is different in people with ALS. Um, mm -hmm. There's been several studies um, in, 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 at our institution, but also in Israel and other countries mm -hmm. that suggest that the bacteria are different. Um, what we what we trying to figure out is, is this actually something that happens before onset? Is it a trigger for the illness or is it part of, does it influence the progression rate of the disease? And right, because right. then we could intervene, we could actually change the microbiome. Yeah. And then, those types of studies are happening in other illnesses and we want to bring that to ALS. I think that's awesome. Uh, you know, and just being from the background that I am with functional and integrative medicine, it's something that personally excites me a lot because, you know, we like to look at the root causes of really any and every chronic disease that we treat in our field. And the gut microbiome has always been sort of the center point of that, um, where you really, you know, we all know that neuroinflammation and just inflammation in general could be one of the different, you know, uh, parts of ALS. And uh, we also know that um, inflammation kind of starts in the gut. And a lot of that is contributed to um, by, you know, what your eating habits might be or what your genetic profile might be, but also, you know, how much antibiotics have you taken? How many gut bacteria, which were healthy bacteria are no longer there. And then do we, are we introducing the healthy bacteria back by using different kinds of probiotic strains, et cetera. So there's a lot of awesome work in that field. And I'm so excited that that is coming to light and hopefully um, we'll come up with um, some kinds of, you know, protocols and treatments that can actually address that, right? Yeah. That's the goal is to understand it enough so that you can start to intervene in people with the symptoms, but also at, at people with, at risk. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, considering the instant, the rate of ALS in the U U.S. is about one in 50,000. Um, I've heard you sort of speak about, you know, that is when you're in your 50s and as you age, it becomes so much more common. I'd really love for you to talk a little bit about that um, for a minute so people can understand that it's really a lot more common than we think it is. Yeah. Because anyone I talk to, um, Merit, just about, and if they find out that my husband has ALS, somehow, somewhere they've known somebody, either a family or a friend or you know, a colleague who has had ALS. And that blows me away. Yeah, me too. I, I do think it's, it's, we call it rare, but it's really not a rare mm -hmm. illness. So, at, um, so the illness peaks in incidence and incidence is a number of people Per hundred thousand per year, right. really peaks in the late seventies, and that so it's about eleven people per hundred thousand. So it's it's several times higher uh, than than the number you said in the mid fifties, one in fifty thousand. Right. right. So, um, and obviously the you know for good reasons the population is aging and aging well. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting we have more and more people in their seventies and eighties who are coming down with it, but. As I said, we're also seeing people in their in their twenties and thirties who do not carry known genes, so it's not a genetic cause. So that that really tells us we need to understand what's out there in the environment that might be increasing also the number of young people getting this. Absolutely, absolutely, and that just all the way, all the more makes us want to really do something about this because it is becoming more and more um, prevalent um, as our population ages. Um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, some of the processes, the, the physiologic processes that occur in the body that, you know, lead to the, um, the impact on the motor neurons and what we call, you know, ALS with the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. What's happening in the body as far as inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, protein misfolding? Do you mind giving a little overview of that for our listeners, sure. please? Yeah, it is a, um, it's a very complex disorder that um, a lot of things are happening in the motor neurons and in the surrounding cells. Mm -hmm. So I'll maybe tackle the inflammation first. We know that early on in the illness, the body is actually trying to decrease inflammation. So we see all those good cells that are um, anti-inflammatory kind of rev up. Um, it's almost like they're trying to block the inflammation, but, and that's a period of time where people tend to be a little, they're, they're getting sick, but they're going a little slowly. Then all of a sudden they can't keep up. And then you get this 
bombardment of pro-inflammatory cells, whether that's T cells or B cells, and then we see the illness tend to speed up. So there's a lot of therapies, for example, in development to try to block that, um, that pro-inflammatory state. And we see that in the blood and in, in, the, in the muscles and also in the brain. So it's really happening everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it's a hopeful target because there's a lot of treatment, a lot of anti-inflammatory approaches on the market for other illnesses that maybe we can repurpose for ALS. Mm-hmm. So that's one part of it. Then the question is, what's driving that inflammation? What's, what's making your body have that? And there we think it is the problem in the motor neuron, that, that the way proteins are, are made and, and uh, folded is not quite right so that you get accumulation of, of uh, what we call misfolded proteins in the motor neurons. You get low energy in the cells. And, and we think that that then triggers this inflammatory response. Mm-hmm. So we might need to tackle all of those pathways, right? To, a bit like cancer, some cancer treatments are four drugs. You know, they're not one one target. We, I think we need that in ALS too. I think that's a, that's a great point um, because there are different processes and every process cannot, it's not a one size fits all, one drug can't address all of those things. So you are, and that brings me to doing something that is really just moving right towards trying to come up with several different um, interventions and several different protocols or drugs that you are doing trials for in the Healy ALS platform trial where you are testing several different things. I think that's so fascinating. Can you talk a little bit about what made you want to do the platform trial and how it's going and perhaps what kinds of um, what kinds of targets are you going after so that you can address several of these different things you mentioned? Yeah, I'll say um, that um, again, from the inspiration from my, the people I've cared for who have always said, can you move this faster? What, what's, what are the barriers? I was kind of looking and thinking about what slows down trial development. And then I read an article from uh, Janet Woodcock from the FDA talking mm-hmm. about something called master protocols and how the FDA was encouraging uh, companies and academics to do this as a way to lower costs for drug development, speed it up. And I'm reading this article and thinking, Wow, like why isn't anyone? Why know. aren't we doing this? <laughs> yeah. And then I always kind of joke, like, if the FDA is saying that I'm, we're really behind, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but uh, but uh, we should be doing this. So we actually convened, uh, we, we got experts from who have done it in oncology to come and teach us, and we asked them, we taught them about ALS, they taught about us about master protocols, and we said, Do you think we're ready? And yeah. they said, Boy, you're ready. You're absolutely ready. You were ready a while ago. So the idea is to test more than one drug in the same trial infrastructure and to um, pool the data from people who might be assigned to placebo for a short time so that you can really minimize that. Mm -hmm. And um, also just cut out the time it takes to start a new trial. So it it really does cut cost by a third and time by half. So I, you know, and I, I even think that we can keep doing this better. We've launched the first one but we're going to keep learning from it so that we can keep finding efficiencies and keep uh, keep uh, cutting down that time for our patients. Absolutely. And uh, just for the listeners, how many um, drugs are you trying at this time? Four drugs. Um, they're all really good drugs. Uh, I hope they all work. Um, and then we have two others that we've um, planning to add on in the fall. Okay. Let's add two or three a year and always pick really great uh, science and the nice thing about these platform trials is if one of them works, you can then make it, you know, the, the baseline for everybody. Everybody gets on and you can keep adding and get to that cocktail of, of treatments. I think that's amazing. Um, just being kind of more realistic, how far do you think we are if one of them works? How quickly does that process occur, especially in light of a platform trial? Yeah, I think if the results are very clear, and, mm-hmm. you know, that it works and it's safe, that we could be amending, you know, the protocol in, in a, a matter of, of a month or two and to put everybody on it. The time where it takes more time is when the results are uh, equivocal, I guess. Well, maybe it works in one part of the system, but not on the, the other part of, of people. Then you need more time to figure it out. But Yeah, absolutely. Another um, huge thing that's um, going on in the field of ALS that you're very involved with as well is gene therapy. Um, that I think is also super exciting, especially for people with familial ALS and for perhaps people that have several 
cases of ALS in their family, but they have an unidentified gene mutation similar to our family. As you know very well, we have three people now with ALS in our family on my husband's side, and we have no idea what gene mutation there is, but we, you know, know uh, with quite certainty that there has to be one. It's just too, um, it's just, it would be too coincidental to have three people so close together um, with ALS, which is a rare condition anyway. Um, so talk to us about that. Where did it start in the field of ALS and where are we now? And what does the next maybe five years look like for gene therapy in our field? First of all, I'll say that people with ALS were pioneers in gene, in gene therapy for any neurological illness. The first actually gene therapy for any neurological disease was in ALS. And this was in 2011 with um, something called an ASO, which is called, stands for anti-sense oligo. It's a way to block um, a, a mutated gene uh, from making the bad protein. Mm -hmm. And we did the first study uh, in people with ALS with SOD1. And back then, you know, uh, this was Tim Miller and myself and a couple other people. The FDA, it was new to the FDA, so they only let us do micro doses. Mm -hmm. So fast forward now, you know, they made a much better one. And we're in the late stage testing, phase three is called, of um, this drug called Tofersen in people with SOD1 ALS. We'll know the results in the fall. And if it's positive, I think it will get speed tracked to um, be a treatment. There's already a prevention trial for that particular um form of ALS with that drug um, that's about to start. Now, the technology's gotten so much better in the last nine years since when we started um, mm -hmm. that you can make these much faster. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there are some nonprofit groups, some academic groups, NIH, that want to start um, fast-tracking, making customized ASOs for people with even rarer forms, where mm -hmm. maybe there's not a pharma. And a good example there is really Neil Schneider at Columbia and their work on FUS, which is a rare genetic cause of ALS in, in Kensington young people, they, they made it. And then um, with, you know, with some company help, and now they're, they're, uh, they've treated about 10 people and they're doing another trial. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's much faster now. So I do think that we'll, when, if we can discover what the gene is that's causing it, the ability to make a gene therapy to modulate it is much faster and much easier than it used to be. It's, it still takes money and time, but we're now now we're talking one year rather than like ten years. That's um, amazing. It's getting faster. Yeah. And if you feel if you think about it, when you come up with gene therapy, do you is your hope with gene therapy to a try to prevent, b slow down the progression, and is there hope of reversing some of the um, functionality that has been lost? I think there is hope to reverse. And, and the reason I think that is because if you can actually stop what's causing the motor neuron to be injured, our mm -hmm. bodies have a repair mechanism. And that kind of gets to the, the, the rest ALS thought. We know this from polio. So when people had the polio virus, it knocked out um, many of their motor neurons. But the surviving motor neurons, once the virus was cleared, could mm -hmm. start to sprout and grow and repair and take over the loss function. And people regained uh, strength. It took a, a long time. Mm -hmm. So I do think that we can, if we can stop the, the, the gene from causing it, that we can repair. And that we also, the field needs to start studying repair. And uh, it has, but it needs more people doing, uh, how do you augment that natural repair process? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I talk about this all the time with my patients, that our bodies are a miraculous being which the natural state of our body is healing is to heal that is our natural state that is what the body naturally does all we need to do is take away the stimuli that has been damaging it which is what we're talking about and then to give it what it needs to heal and you know a lot of it could be as simple as you know the right nutrients the right food the right amount of sleep the stress reduction, you know, um, exercise, not in excess, but exercise, flexibility, yoga, meditation, just all of those things that seem so basic, right? But at the same time, it's really not because it's our body's mechanism to heal, right? Um, and I, I think that you and I have had this discussion where a lot of ALS patients that you and I both meet, 
have had a, a major stress stimuli, not all, but a lot of them have had a major stress stimuli, whether it's a physical trauma or an emotional trauma, psychological trauma. Can you speak about that a little bit? What have you seen in your experience? And of course, you know, there's not studies on it, but we're just talking about experience. Yeah, I, I, um, I think there's something there. I've, I've heard the, the stories from my patients about, and sometimes it's physical, like a car accident. Sometimes it's emotional, like the, the death of a loved one or uh, mm-hmm. other stress. And we're, I think the medicine's a little behind on understanding what stress does to your body and, and, and the immune system and, um, and your gut and, and understanding how that can impact um, causing the illness, but also, as you say, healing. Um, I, I think... I think you're right on um, um, that. Uh, all the things you mentioned can really help people um, re- repair. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I think you know where the science really needs to be, which is exactly what you're working on, is what are those scientific things you know that are causing the damage to begin with, and let's eliminate those. And for different people, it could be so many different things, right? I mean. We know about the study being done at NIH about retroviruses, right? So polio was a virus. Could this be a retrovirus? Could the retrovirus be one of the many things or the retrovirus is important in this person, maybe not in that person. And that's what's so complex, right? It's not, it's not a one thing. And, you know, there's so many different things could, could be pertinent in different ALS patients. And we hear ourselves talk about in many of the you know, group meetings that we have that ALS is not one disease. Everybody's heard that comment. Can you comment on that? What does that mean to you coming from this place of knowing so much about the disease? What does that mean to you? I think it means that there's, there's many ways to get ALS. And we know that from the genes because there's at least 45 different gene mutations that cause ALS. But I think there's probably also a lot of environmental ways to get it or combinations. Mm-hmm. And, but that at some point, I do think at some point, the illness is similar between people. Mm-hmm. So it might be that you get to it a different way and maybe the initial biology is a little different, but right. eventually everybody has that infl- inflammation. Or, right. or the protein was folding. Mm-hmm. So there might be times like at the beginning where maybe there's more unique treatments for people based on their right. cause, but at some point there's also going to be some common drugs. And mm-hmm. so we want to keep an open mind to both that we some individualized treatment as well as some drugs that will help or approaches that will help everybody. That's a great summary of it. It's almost like many, lo- many roads lead to the same destination here. And once there is a tipping point, and I always kind of think about it as, you know, these different stimuli are happening. And then at one fine day, there is a tipping point and that tipping point leads to that protein misfolding or the inflammation. And then you go down this path of the motor neurons getting disrupted. Um, and it's, it's complex, very complex, yet you can kind of think about it that way and you start peeling the onion and say, okay, how do we reduce the inflammation? Because we know that's a part of it. How do we reduce stress? How do we reduce environmental toxins? And then perhaps come up with a, you know, like you said, many commonalities that we can do, but also some specifics depending on is there a gene mutation or what have you. Very complex, isn't it? Yeah, I think you get it Uh, because there's so many smart people uh, working on this and working together with um, the people in the families. Also, you know, when you talked about the retrovirus, I was thinking that a couple of years ago, we never had that even idea in ALS. And all of a sudden, there's all this great data that maybe some endogenous retroviruses are activated. So you, we don't know what's going to come out tomorrow about some new discovery in this field. Exactly. And you know what's exciting is you mentioned this earlier, and you know, you and I have talked about this. Young people are really focused on this illness, not just ALS, but other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, We know with the Amalex, I mean, these were two college kids at Brown who came up with this incredible product that is now, um, you know, being tested. Um, So tell us about that. Tell us that story, because I think the young people listening will be super fascinated by what these two college, um, you know, undergrads came up with. That's an amazing story. Uh, Josh and Justin at, at Brown, they were thinking about Alzheimer's disease initially and what pathways might happened there and then were there some available drugs already that that could target more than one pathway and they came up with this combination of tutta and bufanol 
Mm-hmm. One that attacks like how your cells make energy and the other one, how your cells t- get rid of badly made proteins. And both those pathways are important for ALS too. Mm-hmm. They called one of our investigators and I, I love this part of the story because he always says, I wouldn't have answered them if they weren't in the same fraternity that I was in. <laughs> Well, thank God for fraternities then, huh? <laughs> my children, all right, you can be in a sorority. All right. <laughs> That's great. Just don't party too hard. <laughs> I said to them, okay, it's a, it's a crazy idea, but go, um, go um, do this experiment and come back if it's positive. And they did. And fast forward, they were right. And it works in uh, models of Alzheimer's. It works in models of ALS. And mm-hmm. I met them and, and introduced them to our Neil's um, consortium scientists and clinical trials who were just so excited to help young people with a new idea. And we reported last year that the trial in people with ALS was positive, which is just huge. It's huge. It's huge. You know, it's, uh, it always excites me when I see young people because their minds are wired very uniquely than, you know, our generation, I like to think they just they there's no limit to their possibilities. They don't think in limits. They don't think in what cannot be done. And they don't think about obstacles. They just go free flow. And I think that's what's going to get us to where we need to go is to recruit more young mites. I mean, you know, you know, that Zoe and Zaid are super committed to ALS. I mean, Zoe's at uh, UT Austin studying neuroscience and, uh, you know, proud mama moment. She won the uh, (laughs) undergraduate research award for her ALS technology work, but only because of the passion. You know, I always say the passion is what drives your success. Just don't worry about the results. Just keep following your passion. And I know with you, um, your daughter is really interested in MS. Tell us what, what she's doing um, and what she's, uh, really gung-ho about. She's also a neuroscience uh, major undergrad. Yes, yeah. she's working at Mount Sinai in, um, in their multiple sclerosis unit and studying actually diet and lifestyle um, impact on that illness. And she loves it. And she loves the patient. She loves the research. And it's nice to see as a mom, um, as someone, you know, your, your children find their passion. Oh, yeah. You know, and uh, Zaid's following the same track in neuro- neuroscience again at UT Austin. I think it's just those young minds are going to hopefully take us where we need to go. Let's talk a little bit about where is ALS technology going? You know, there is, there is the part of, of course, we want to find um, treatments and hopefully one day soon a cure. What about improving the quality of life um, while patients have ALS and are unable to do so much, including, you know, caring for themselves, um, feeding themselves, speaking or communicating with you know, their eyes, if they lose their voice. Talk to us a little bit about where technology is going in the field of ALS. Yeah, it's, it's, first of all, there's a lot to do there, but it's a lot better than it used to be. And it's really important to, to p- keep people um, communicating, doing the things that they want to do. Um, mm-hmm. So I, we really encourage people to be very proactive about that and to work with their teams. I think there's, there's a lot of good ways to help people communicate, which is you know, what, what our patients just tell us is so, so vital to, um, to quality of life and passion. And, and so there's, uh, there's um, lots of devices there. Okay. However, we can always use more and more improvements. Um, also for um, mobility, I, I'd say the gap, one of the gaps is really around um, hand and arm function. Mm-hmm. Uh, there and and so there there's um, you know a couple of new companies working in this and I know some of the foundations have tried to incentivize um, mm-hmm. people to work on that so that we can uh, really help uh, people with every part of their their illness. Yeah, and I think it's uh, you know it's crucial living with. You know, I always say our family has ALS, not just my husband has ALS and living with it 24 seven, you sort of, you know, see the limitations. And these are limitations that, uh, you know, an average person who's not lived with someone with ALS just couldn't even imagine, you know, the how much small things that you can do, how big of a meaning that is, right? So, um, technology is coming a long way, and I'm so excited about several things, including one of the most exciting things I feel is the brain computer interface yes. that is happening in our field because it can control so much. And you just computers have come so far, and we know what a powerful device the brain is. And if we combined the two, well, you know, 
the world is our oyster. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of um, treatments or what kind of uh, research is being done in brain computer interface? This is so, so important. So there are both what we call invasive and non-invasive approaches. So mm-hmm. invasive is really not that invasive, but it means like putting a chip in the brain near the motor cortex so that people can control with their thoughts, a computer screen, a wheelchair, a device, a robotic arm. And Lee Hochberg and our group and, and many others are really leading on that. And we have had several of our patients be part of those initial trials. Again, the pioneers and really brave. And what what we didn't know was whether it would work, you know, could, um, but it did. And, and actually it's pretty quick um, after it's put in there that people can start to move a cursor or start to use it. And it's been really uh, life-changing for, for those participants. There's also a lot of companies working on things that maybe they can use scalp EEG or, or, EM, or EMG or something that doesn't require um, putting a device in. And I think we're just going to have to see which, which approach or which combination is better for our, for our patients um, so we can keep them um, as independent as possible. Absolutely. And I want to give a shout out to Lee Hochberg. I mean, what an amazing gentleman, you know, is so passionate. He told me the other day while we were speaking is if there's one thing that he can do is to be able to tell every ALS patient that you will never lose the ability to communicate. And that's something that just really touched my heart because, you know, once you do lose your ability to com- communicate, it's what we call a locked in syndrome, where you just, you have all these thoughts and feelings and emotions, and there's no way to express them. And that to me is one of the saddest things about ALS, you know, yeah. but he's doing incredible work in it. And so is, you know, Elon Musk with his company, Neuralink and Paradromics and just amazing companies doing amazing work. And it just, just warms my heart that all of this is going on, which brings me to, there are so many things going on in all different um, fields of the different neurodegenerative diseases, right? So whether it be Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, um, you know, or MS or others, what are we doing to, you know, get the best of everything that's going on, because there are similarities. You've said it yourself. There are similarities in that umbrella of neurodegenerative diseases. Do we have the hopes and a plan of, you know, how you have the Niels Consortium? Do we have a plan to bring the experts from all the different neurodegenerative diseases together at some point in some manner to be able to see what the commonalities are and gain from each other's research and push everything forward for everybody yeah, yeah. we we uh, need to put uh, like i said put that on steroids some of it happens but but not enough so i'll say just for example at our institution here at mass general all our neurodegenerative uh, disease scientists work in the same building and we cross fertilize so it's mixed on each floor so uh, so there you get that connection and we do the same on the clinical trialists but you almost have to do this on a global scale mm-hmm. and uh, there are now starting to be some international meetings that for neurodegeneration. You know, they used to start just Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Now they're Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. So, but we need more of those because um, there, there's there are a lot of overlaps and uh, a lot of information, and we need a way to um, make those connections uh, much more fluid and easy. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and what what is being done? You know, so I see that a lot of work that we're doing is try to um, slow down the progression, right? What do you tell patients who have sort of, you know, missed that boat and are now at really advanced stages of ALS, whether they're on a ventilator and they don't have any movement, can't communicate? What's being done for those patients at this time? Would you say? Yeah. I think we need to do more. I mean, there's certainly um, t- the technology to, to try to help with um, with communication and any return of function. Um, and there's people working on um, regrowing motor neurons, but it's not quite there now. Um, but but there are definitely labs working on this. For example, we can now take from people's blood their cells, their stem cells, and make their motor neurons from it. Um, and so people are, are working on, can you... Exciting implant those into um, people and, and um, help them grow and reconnect. So it's, it's not, it sounds science fiction, but it, it's not anymore. Um, yeah. So I, I'd say the first study like that, it has been done in Parkinson's where they, they made the Parkinson's dopamine cells and they put it into the part of the brain mm-hmm. safely and the person's doing well. That uh, So 
it was a little more complicated because we, we don't have one spot to put it in, mm -hmm. but it's not impossible. So I think that's kind of the next frontier for um, kind of that type of recovery. That's amazing. And, you know, we, we just need to find those researchers from all over the world and bring them together and kind of incentivize them and get them working harder, faster, you know, more, 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 more. And it's hard, right? I mean, there's only so many hours in the day, but, and then I, I think it's important to see kind of where each person's passion is or each scientist's passion is or each institution. Um, but I think, you know, I have to say kudos to the entire world of researchers um, for all the amazing work. I mean, just what we've talked about in this um, short time is there's so much work being done in so many different fields, all of which pertain to this umbrella of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. I want to kind of end with hope. Yes. Hope for the patients, the families, the caregivers, the loved ones. Um, and whenever I think about hope, I, you know, I think about all the great work that you're doing and also think about Dr. Bedlack's work on ALS reversals. Can you tell our listeners um, about the work that Dr. Bedlack is doing so amazingly at Duke University where he's documenting the reversals? Can you just summarize that for us? Yeah, he's a, an amazing physician. So he, what he's doing is uh, finding people who have reported being diagnosed with ALS and then who have recovered from it. And that whole concept is you know, something we, we didn't think about until a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what he'll do is review the records. If he can meet the person, he'll meet them. And then he's, he's studying them. If he decides that, yes, that person really had ALS, they really mm -hmm. recovered, he's mm -hmm. getting their DNA, their blood, trying to understand what's different about them. How did they recover from this? Was it something they took, something they did in their lifestyle? Is it in their genes? and try to understand it. And uh, I think he has over 50 people now. Yeah. I sent him two people that I care for that I thought were reversals. And so I do think it's a real thing. I'll just compare it to um, HIV for a minute because there were some people in the early days of the, of the AIDS pandemic or epidemic who were not getting sick even though they were infected. And people started to study them and they figured that out. That, you know why why they were able to uh, prevent it, and that's leading to treatments for that disease. And I think that's what Rick's doing. He's going to figure it out. Um, he's working with you know a lot of a lot of great people, yeah. and that's going to give us a clue to help everybody. That's amazing. And I know you and I have spoken about some people that um, that you've seen, and um, Mark Manchester being one. I'm sure he doesn't mind me mentioning his name because he is such an advocate, and he talks to so many patients with ALS, but this particular individual was on a ventilator and in a wheelchair and is no longer on a ventilator, eats by himself as well as is able to walk sometimes with the help of a walker, but is an, a remarkable individual. You've actually witnessed this in your practice. Um, what does it do to you when you see that? I mean, it must just give you so much endless joy, right? Yes. Joy, hope, it's amazing. And, um a new direction of what to study because it's, it's possible. You know, you, you think it's not possible. All of a sudden it's possible. It's, and then you get energized to try to understand it. So it can be possible for many more. Exactly. Exactly. And I kind of just want to mention also um, when Dr. Bedlack, you know, finds these products or products come to him, he reports them on ALS untangled and, you know, tries to look into all those products. And he's got um, a few things that he's recommending with the curcumin, the theracurmin, and some of the other things where he sees the commonality. Um, so it's really going to be an interesting, you know, uh, set of results that we're going to get. I remember speaking to him at the same conference where I'd met you four years ago. And it's interesting, at that time, he had said that when he looks at the reversals, um, most of them are males, younger males, um, is where he's sort of seeing that. And I you know, he didn't really have an explanation for that. And of course, it's just observation, but it's going to be extremely interesting to see the commonalities um, and the hope that we can potentially reverse this disease. So to end, Merit, if you were speaking to someone with a new diagnosis of ALS directly, what would you tell them to give them some hope for the future? I'd say that we're in a new age in ALS. There is hope. There are options for you today 
um, and, and go through those options. And that there's so many trials going on that we have to keep in close touch <laughs> so that, because the options might, keep, might change fast. And then that we're really partners in trying to figure out what the best option is for them um, so that, that we can um, really help them as much as we can. That's, that's awesome, you know, and it is such a far cry from, you know, maybe a couple of decades ago where a newly diagnosed patient was essentially said, you know, you have ALS, there is no hope, there is no treatment, you know, get your affairs in order. This is not what we're saying to our patients yeah. now. And it's, you know, it just warms all of our hearts that there is hope with this condition. It does not need to mean a death sentence because we are working tirelessly People like you and so many other wonderful researchers are working tirelessly. Um, Dr. Sudovich, it has been such a pleasure and honor to speak with you today. This will surely, surely help bring awareness to ALS for those who weren't familiar with it before. Um, to the listeners, if you or a loved one has been diagnosed with ALS and are interested in undergoing um, the ALS platform trial, we have contact information for you in the show notes. You can reach out and see, um, you know, if you qualify and if there's space. And it's not exclusive to the people in the Boston area. There are 52 locations, right, Merritt, across um, the United States that are currently enrolling patients for trials and treatments. Uh, Merritt, thank you again for your time. Thank you for having me. And it's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. You're such a busy individual, and uh, yet you're so devoted to spreading the word and to create more awareness and bring an end to this disease. So from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Thank you so much for making time for today's podcast with Get Well with Dr. Shell. I know that this conversation and education can help you to create your best life possible on every level. So definitely tune in to hear the newest expert and learn the latest protocols to support your best health journey. You can learn more about me and my wellness center at drshell.com, drshfl.com, and I hope that you will make time to come visit us in the Houston area to take a deep dive on self-care. My team and I are completely devoted to helping you live a better life from, the, from this moment forward. The best days of your life are ahead of you. I promise. This podcast is a powerful and simple way to carry the wisdom of thought leaders from around the world in your pocket and continue to develop your own healing journey every single day. So let the journey begin.